we could also say Jesus is gay and any other identity being humiliated. One of my students, Jacqueline Grant, said Jesus is a black woman and she is right. Jesus is a way of talking about God's solidarity with people who are hurt and despised. This is Reverend Dr. James Cone, the father of black liberation theology. And this is in his final book. Said I wasn't going to tell nobody. Jesus is a black woman and she is right. Today, 54 years ago, Mrs. Coretta Scott King marched with 42,000 people through Memphis streets to finish the work of her husband, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., work he'd come to do with the sanitation workers. She came to stand up and to stand with the garbage workers who'd been mistreated, misused and abused by Mayor Loeb and his capitalistic, exploitative cronies. She was here today, 54 years ago, about this time with three children in tow, dressed in black with a veil over her face, mourning, mourning that Dr. King had been assassinated. She came before he was buried before there was a funeral with 150,000 people in Atlanta. That would happen tomorrow, 54 years ago. Mr. Coretta Scott King was in Memphis, Tennessee, walking our city streets, standing up against white supremacist terrorism and a racism in government that believed that they could kill hope on the balcony of the Lorraine Motel. We're here today because I believe God has placed a word on my heart on such a special and a solemn day as this one to speak a word about a movement that never dies. Would you pray with me? Now, Mother God, Creator God, loving God, uh, take this, your servant, made from dust and connected with the raw materials of stardust to speak in this moment to say something that brings forward the word you've placed into my heart. I accept my unworthiness for such a task and as bold as this one. I seek your guidance as you use me and speak through me. To the ancestor preachers who made sermons from hymns and moans and groans and spirituals from the bondage of slavery, speak now through this, your descendant, to the black women who've been locked out, beaten, abused, tormented, raped, and yet born a new and distant future in this country. And to a young colored boy named me, I name you now, great-grandmothers Anna Ruth and great-grandmother Flossie, grandmother Pearson and grandmother Gwen and my own mother Kimberly. To the preachers who've preached before me and will now, to my daddy Jason, my Paul, my granddaddy, my uncle and my auntie before, before me. To you, loving mother, loving father, Father, loving sister, loving brother, loving friend, preach. If it's my voice, I'll lose it for you. If it's my hands, I'll clap them for you. If it's my feet, let them jump praising you. Whatever it is, God, you use it. So a word of justice and a word of love might come forward in these few moments. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want to give special recognition, honor, and thanks to the angel of this house, the Reverend uh, Scott Walters, uh, for this wonderful opportunity to Heidi Rupke, who if you've ever worked with her, you know angels exist uh, because she can tolerate people who are intolerable. Uh, and I find myself that person too often. Uh, and so really grateful for that. I got some wonderful prayer beads here from Suzanne and the congregation as a gift. And I thank you for that. Uh, and and I, I, I will not not do this, which is give special gratitude and thanks to uh, my friend and brother in this movement and a great parishioner of this congregation, uh, Scott Crosby, uh, right there, hey Meg, uh, who is a caring person, a committed friend, uh, and a person who understands that King's words days before his assassination in Memphis matter. The movement lives or dies in Memphis, and Scott has been on the front lines of the fight alongside us and with us, and I'm grateful to you, uh, to my parents, uh, Kimberly and Jason Pearson, and my brother Jalen, who's here, my brothers who are watching virtually. Uh, I love you, uh, and thank you uh, to my movement family uh, who are gathered here, and I know we'll have some more folks joining. Uh, uh, I am here because you have chosen to stand up, uh, and because we have decided that now is the moment, and this is the time for justice 
to come to Memphis and to our country. Today, before this service, I had the privilege and opportunity. Well, I'll say this. I said I wasn't, but I'll say it anyway. Uh, my daddy grew up Baptist. Uh, my daddy's a preacher. Uh, I come from a line of preachers, and we black. Uh, I know most of y'all's services are about 15 minutes of good preaching, uh, and then everybody goes home. Uh, uh, but I'm still the son uh, of, of that tradition, and uh, I'm still going to get you to the, to the waffles and everything, but, but bear with me, uh, uh, if you will, just for a minute, just for a minute longer than you typically do, uh, if you don't mind. Uh, I, I had the opportunity to go and talk with the ancestors at a plaque that has been put up by Calvary right over yonder. It's a plaque uh, that remembers the 3,000 people uh, who were sold adjacent to this church uh, by one Nathan Bedford Forrest, who we know, uh, and several others. And the question that I had in my soul even before going was uh, to the ancestors, now that your soul is looking back, what does it mean for we who remain? I talked and asked them, what does it mean to be in this fight now? Am I living up to what they sacrificed for in the cotton fields of Mississippi or the rice plantations of South Carolina where we come from? Here, only a few hundred feet from this door in this pristine church was Memphis's marketplace for selling human beings, enslaving them, separating them from their families, creating a social death. And it was powerful to have the opportunity to talk with them. I was overcome with grief, overcome with emotion, and my parents carried me back in here with tears in my eyes because it is important yet so difficult to remember. This is who we are. And if we shy away from that, difficult remembrances if we shy away from the fact that my ancestors were there, but so were yours, then what were they doing? And what does it call for us to do now? These are the questions we are forced to ask. And if you answer in the affirmative, recognizing that there's something you got to do, then you understand that this status quo that we are currently living in is untenable. Again, I'll try not to be before you long. We've been at this 99 years, and I don't want to get the record of the longest sermon ever preached <laughs> at Calvary. But I do believe there is a word for us gathered today, both here and virtually. A movement that never dies. I have, and you've heard that old text of scripture really ably read by my colleague and good friend Paul. Uh, it's a text that if you've been to church often, you know it well. If you haven't been to church in a while, you'll get to know it. But I hope in the time that is mine with yours that I might, as I heard one old preacher say, go to an old well and bring up fresh water. Jesus is talking with his disciples about heaven. Uh, the sweet by and by, the great thereafter, the over yonder we sang about. They asked a question actually starting in Matthew 22. If you have your Bibles, you can go look it up. I, I recommend you do it when you go home. And he uses parables to answer their question. They say, tell us, when will this be? And what will the sign of your coming at the end of the age be? They're trying to figure out what to look for. And Jesus does not, Jesus does not answer directly. He meanders a little bit. Uh, uh, and he gives these parables as a way for them to try and attempt to understand. And he does this several times. So he answers them without answering them. Yet he does something instructive. He gives them instructions. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, a refugee, and you welcomed me. I was naked. I was homeless. I was houseless. I was poor. And you gave me clothing. I was sick, without health care, and you took care of me. I was in prison, over-incarcerated. Slavery evolved. 
and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food? Or thirsty and gave you something to drink. And when was it that we saw you a refugee, a stranger, and welcomed you at the border? Or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick and without health care? Or in prison and incarcerated and over incarcerated? And we visited you and the king will answer them. Truly, I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family. I've read this scripture a lot. I ain't never heard that part until I started writing this. Who are members of my family. You did it to me. God is the God on the side of oppressed folk. Members of my family, you did it to me. A movement that never dies will be rooted in love, rooted in compassion, and will be triumphant. You see, Meg, I'm moving forward. First, a movement that never dies is rooted in love. We know the scriptures talk about love. We, we, we hear about it. We obsess about it. We even have a full holiday to capitalistically use it and exploit it in order to say we celebrate in love. We, we talk about this, and one of my closest friends bought me a book called All About Love by Bell Hooks. I recommend it to everybody. Bell Hooks argues that we have not actually been taught how to love. She says there are classes for everything, but there are no classes on how to love people well. She says, we haven't been taught how to love. And there are a lot of lessons that we think you're just supposed to get because of osmosis or because of the community or the family that you're in. And that is not always the case. You have to develop a love ethic. It takes work, intention, she says, and action in order to build a love ethic. And because we, we haven't been taught how to love, we haven't loved the planet well. Uh, we haven't loved strangers well well and refugees we haven't loved widows or orphans well or the incarcerated or hiv patients or the poor or the queer people well we haven't learned how to love well yet and our society is suffering because of it there is an internationally observed war being waged in ukraine by a dictatorial government that had america's support during the previous presidential administration 73 million people supported that vision of America supporting tyrants. We do not know how to love well. We're witnessing kindergartens becoming burial grounds in this country of Ukraine. This is a tragedy. And at the same time, we are witnessing white supremacy and patriarchy at its height. We are witnessing the ways these very systems are doing harm to people of color. At the Mexico border, Ukrainians seeking asylum might bring moved to the front of the line, quite literally, while our Mexican brothers and sisters who waited for months just witnessed them passing in front. While white Ukrainians are being welcomed into the homes of people across Europe, we remember that during the Syrian civil war, laws were being propagated in these same countries to close the borders to Europe. And we remember images that looked like slave ships, which carried my ancestors away from their homes that they had inhabited for hundreds of thousands of years, looking very reminiscent to people escaping civil war. We are not sure how to love. And there is no movement that can survive voided. Billion dollar corporations believe that they could build a pipeline through a lower income black Memphis community, taking the land of Mrs. Scotty Fitzgerald and Mr. Clyde Robinson that was given to them by their ancestors in order that the companies might make more profit from a dying fossil fuel industry. And even now, we have Republican Kevin Vaughn out of Collierville working to make it easier for pipeline companies to do this. We aren't loving well. There's a lack of love persisting in our society. And the Jesus we talk about and believe in is attempting to bring awareness to this void. Awareness to this, this status quo, this devastating status quo that is removed from its intentional consciousness. People's actions of love. This status quo harms all of us. A status quo that has seen over one million people die from COVID. And hundreds of thousands of those deaths being unnecessary, that, that, that's devastating status quo. 
Poor People's Campaign just released that if you were poor, you were two times more likely to die from COVID than the average person. We have a devastating status quo, a status quo that refused to increase the child tax credit for poor families because senators who are millionaires were afraid that the parents might use the money for drugs instead of for care of their children. We have, we have a devastating status quo where 200,000 people every year die from air pollution in our country. And a black child is 10 times more likely to die from an asthmatic incident than a white child. We have a devastating status quo when Southwest Memphians die 4.1 times, are 4.1 times more likely to have cancer than the average group. We have a devastating status quo when Memphis has a poverty rate of 24.6% and child poverty of 39.6% and black folks are a third of them are in poverty and Latinos are a third in poverty and white folks just 11% in poverty. We have a devastating status quo where your zip code has way more to do with your outcomes than your genetic code. Memphis and this community around us were number one in poverty overall and in child poverty. 50% of the children going to school are living below the poverty line. Our voting rights are under attack. Our polling locations for 75% of the people in this city has changed. Districts are being gerrymandered. We have a devastating status quo with 400,000 people without access to health care in Tennessee. We have a devastating status quo when the pollution and the redlining continue to intersect and there are too few people advocating for the change. It's a devastating status quo. When black Americans are incarcerated in state prisons five times more than white Americans. And America itself incarcerates 20% of the world's population of people who are in prison. What, 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 what is there that we can do with this devastating status quo? Well, I'm convinced in my short time being here, I'll take another pause about the black church. We talk back in church. So somebody say amen. amen. Somebody help me out here. Uh, I'm going to get you to the waffles, I promise. <laughs> but stick with me. Stick with me. I got to hear it. I got to feel it. We're in this together. Uh, we believe there is a different way. We believe there's another way for us to be. And this should give us hope. Uh, we, we should have hope that there is a love ethic that can exist, even if it's not here yet. We, we should have a hope that there's truth telling that's possible. Even though it may not be here yet, there is an opportunity for justice for all. Even though it's not, not here yet, there's reason to have hope. So, so, so don't be too caught up in how devastating the situation is. Because there's reason to have hope. We just got to tell the truth about our current predicament and situation. Marion Williamson, she talks about this in Healing of America. She says, the backlash, quote, the backlash against welfare in America today is not really a backlash against welfare abuse so much as it is a backlash against compassion in the public sphere. See, to care for the marginalized and the excluded, right? To give of ourselves to a movement without compensation, that, 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 that is compassion that is required in the public sphere. To require that the top 1% pay their fair share into America's coffers. That, that this is necessary and it is equally subversive to the status quo that would rather see people dehumanized. We've got to stop turning people into things. We've got to stop turning people into problems and realize the sanctity of our shared humanity and by doing so change the status quo. I, I believe Miss, Mrs. King was right 54 year, years ago when she was forcing Memphis and the country to ask how long will it take. This part was rhetorical, but she said, I think we can catch a spirit. And the true meaning of this experience, she said, I believe that this nation can be transformed into a society of love, of justice, of peace and brotherhood where all men can really be brothers. She says this four years, after, four days after her husband is assassinated on the balcony of the Lorraine. She says this as the, the country is on fire because hope seemed to just be extinguished. She says this at a moment of pure pain where her love partner will be no more. She says this. From that moment, it cracks through that there's still another way possible. 
And so we, who are in this moment, we must believe that there is this other way possible. We're called to love. We are called to do justice. We are called to believe in peace and to build community. Healing is a communal activity. Calvary, and you have displayed that in the display of the monument next door. In other faith traditions, forgiveness is actually a set-aside holy day. Healing has to happen and is transformational in allowing the community, the city, the country to heal from its wounds of racism and white supremacy and capitalistic exploitation. We're in need of love, of compassion, and of healing. Dr. King came to Memphis twice. The first time he came, there was violence at the march. But before the march, he, he gave a, a very powerful speech that I think echoes the moment. He said, as I came in tonight, I turned around and said to Ralph Abernathy, they really have a great movement here in Memphis. You're demonstrating something here that needs to be demonstrated all over our country. You are demonstrating that we can stick together. And you are demonstrating that we are all tied in a single garment of destiny. And that if one black person suffers, if one black person is down, we are all down. He continued, and I came here to say to America that, to, that America is going to hell if she doesn't use her wealth. If America does not use her vast resources of wealth to end poverty and make it possible for all of God's children to have the basic necessities of life, she too will go to hell. And I will hear America through her historians years and generations to come saying, we built gigantic buildings to kiss the skies. We built gargantuan bridges to span the seas. Through our, through our spaceships, we were able to carve highways through the stratosphere. Through our airplanes, we were able to dwarf distance and place time in chains. Through our submarines, we were able to penetrate oceanic depths. And it seems that I can hear the God of the universe saying, even though you've done all that, I was hungry and you fed me not. I was naked and you clothed me not. The children of my sons and daughters were in need of economic security and you didn't provide it to them. And so you cannot enter the kingdom of greatness. He says this may well be the indictment on America. And the same voice says in Memphis to the mayor, to the power structure, if you do it unto the least of my children, you do it unto me. Uh, he, could have, he could have been preaching this sermon. Y'all, we are in a fight today. To preserve a movement that truly never dies. And I'm excited that we are continuing the work of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., his last campaign, the Poor People's Campaign. Today, we're announcing the launch of the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival, Memphis and Mid-South Coalition, uh, with myself and Reverend Gordon Myers helping to lead that charge. Uh, and May 23rd, we'll be at the National Civil Rights Museum elevating the cause of poor and marginalized people in our city and in our community because now is the time for the voices of the impacted, the voices of the marginalized, the voices of the excluded to be elevated and lifted up because this is the time for justice and we can't wait any longer. A movement that never dies will be rooted in love, rooted in compassion and good news. It'll be rooted in triumph ward. A movement that never, never dies will be compassionate. Hungry and you gave me food. Thirsty, you gave me drink. Sick and you took care of me. In prison and you visited me. Jesus' social location as a carpenter was all right. He had a family business. He had, he had gotten a treat from his daddy. And he was doing all right. Jesus had things going just steady and fine. Uh -huh. But then he made an intentional choice to choose a social location with some other folk yeah. who daddies didn't have businesses to inherit. Uh -huh. He chose a social location with some other folks yeah. who didn't grow up 
with the ways of, of trades and skills that he had. And Jesus began to choose a social location with some marginalized and excluded folks. And I, I think there's a lesson for us about if, you, if you're here and you're Christian and you serve a Jesus and who chose a social location with marginalized folk. If you happen to have one or two degrees on your wall or you happen to have a bank account that you're not worried about your next meal when 49% of America can't come up with $400. If you're in that group of people who have a higher social location because you benefited from white supremacy and patriarchy and capitalism and economic exploitation of others. If you happen to be one of those folks, I, I'm calling today for you to choose a social location that is different from the one you inherit. Jesus, if you want to follow Jesus, you got to choose a social location. I got, yeah, I got, I got, I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep going. Uh, uh, um, something, something that's powerful to remember about Jesus uh, as he has this transformation is that he remembered where he was born. I can't stay here too long because it's Friday and not Sunday, but he remembered where he was born. See, many of us celebrate the story of Christmas time. Uh, m many of us uh, love the story. Can't, can't wait for Christmas to come and talk about the baby swaddled in a manger. But see, Jesus, as he was growing up, he remembered that his mama didn't have anywhere to go when he was born. He, he remembered that, that he was placed in a trough. He, he was placed in the, in the lowest place that you can imagine for a newborn baby to be born with the smells of animals and all these other things. He remembered where he'd come from. He didn't let the privilege of an occupation and stability take away the reality that he had been from a place that didn't have those privileges. And there were still some people there. I'm going to keep going. I, 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 what you do for the least of these, you also do unto me. I'm, I'm going to temporarily problematize least of these. I, I, I don't want anyone hearing this to leave thinking that there are people who are lesser, uh, that there are people who have a deficiency, that there are people who are inherently lower than you are. The reality is people have been made least. Somebody say made least. Somebody say made least. People have been made least. Our systems have made people least. Our systems have made people not have. Our systems have made sure that the minimum wage is $7.25 an hour. Our systems are making people least. They're not inherently deficient. So I'm here at Calvary. I might not get invited back <laughs> to ask a question. Is there anybody here willing to launch a movement with people who've been made least? Yeah, yeah. Is there anybody here willing to launch a movement with people whose communities have been redlined? Launch a movement with people who experienced genocide and were forced onto lands called reservations. Are there people in this community who are willing to launch a movement with those who need access to opportunity? Yeah. LGBTQ folks who have been kicked out of their homes and homeless folks who can't afford the rent. It's a question yeah. about whether or not you're willing to launch a movement with those who've been made least. Yeah. And this, this might be the question God is calling for us to answer. If there's anybody here uh -huh. willing to launch a movement yeah. with those made least, yeah. but can you do it with the heart of love? Yeah. And can you do it with the spirit of compassion? Yeah. Right after Jesus says these things that we've read, the chief priest and the elders of the people, you can go to your Bibles, it's chapter 26, verse 3, they gathered in the palace of the high priest who was called Caiaphas and they conspired to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. Right after Jesus starts talking about doing for those who've been made least, the people in power, the next, go to your Bible, the people in power get ready to kill him. Once he started talking about elevating the voices of people who've been excluded, the next action of the status quo was to silence them. Yeah. This, is, th this is what we're dealing with now. Yeah. This is our reality now. Yeah. That once you, you, you ought to be saying some things. Yeah. 
that get people who are in positions of power concerned. You ought to be saying some things and doing some things that disrupt the status quo in a way that they begin to conspire. But it's good news, even when they conspire, even when they try to stop you, even when they try and knock you down, there's a persistence of justice. There's a persistence of opportunity that pushes toward progress. Yeah, we see this antithetical nature, this, this push and pull of our society. You say black lives matter. Some folks say all lives matter. You say protect the environment. They say protect industry. We always have this push in our society because the enemies of progress are our consistent and persistent folk. But oh, there's good news. That hope is a persistent force. That love is a persistent force force and we have the opportunity and ability to demand that the demons that the demons go that they flee because in you and you and you and you and everyone watching there's a more powerful spirit within us that cannot be bowed that cannot be broken that cannot be bent I'm going to my seat, but uh, I, I, I want to share the good news. We're in a movement that'll never die. We are in a movement that will never die. Well, Justin J. Pearson, how do you know that this movement will never die? Corporations still seem to hold the power. Uh -huh. Top 1% still seem to have all the money. Uh -huh. Politicians seem to be bought off and paid, crafting policies of destruction. Uh -huh. Prison population is exploding. Uh -huh. Millions are dying because they don't have access to health care. Yeah. Our schools and our neighborhoods are more segregated now than ever before. How can you come to Calvary this Friday, a week before Good Friday, and tell this story that the movement is not only not dead, but it will never die? How can you tell this story with all the winds and waves that surround us? How do you say this? Well, I am glad that you asked. <laughs> I'm so glad that you asked, yes. because my spirit, Bitsy and Margaret, asked the same question. My spirit wondered, how did we get from the auction block outside yes. to the pulpit of this place? Yes. And some shouts rang out, uh -huh. nobody but Jesus. <laughs> nobody but Jesus. Yes. From the depths of the Atlantic Ocean to the shores of these Native American lands, nobody but Jesus. Then the ancestors who've already gone on to receive their reward spoke to me from the cotton fields and plantations, from beatings and from lynchings, from bruisings and from rapings. And they said, Justin, nobody but Jesus. Nobody but Jesus. Nobody. But Jesus, then Harriet Tubman spoke to me. She said, I've heard their groans and sighs and seen their tears. And I would give every drop of blood in my veins to free them. This movement will never die. Sojourner Truth said, so I am keeping for the thing going while things are stirring. Because if we wait till it's still, it will take a great while to get going again. This movement will never die. Fannie Lou Hamer said, sometimes yeah. it seemed like to tell the truth today yeah. is to run the risk of being killed. Yeah. But if I fall, yeah. I'll fall five feet, four inches forward yeah. in the fight for freedom. I'm not back. And all the movement yeah. will never die. Coretta Scott King said, freedom and justice cannot be parceled out 
in pieces to suit political convenience. I don't believe you can stand for freedom for one group of people and deny it to others. This movement will never die. Mary McLeod Bethune said, if we accept and acquiesce in the face of discrimination, we accept the responsibility ourselves and allow those responsible to solve their conscience by believing that they have our acceptance and concurrence. We should, therefore, protest openly everything that smacks of discrimination or slander. The movement will never die. Aretha, Aretha Franklin, the great singer during the civil rights struggle said, there were certain restaurants that I could not eat at. Uh -huh. We bought groceries, then ate them in the car. Yeah. When we stopped to get gas, we had to go to certain gas stations uh -huh. because we could not use the restrooms at all of them. Yeah. We could only use the ones at Gulf, she said. Mm. We've come a long way. Yeah. Because of Dr. King and the civil rights movement, my life is changed. The movement will never die. Former First Lady Michelle Obama, I wake up yeah. every morning, she said, while still in the White House, in a house that was built by slaves. Yeah. And I watched my daughters, two beautiful, intelligent black women, playing with their dogs on the White House lawn. It's a movement yeah. that'll never die. And I could go on, yeah. even about my own enslaved ancestor, Sylvia, uh -huh. and my elders and angels, Anna Ruth and Everline and Eddie May and Gwendolyn yeah. and Kimberly, yeah. too. Yeah. But my soul wouldn't stop there. My soul journeyed to 2,022 years ago and looked to a hill called Calvary. Yeah. And on that lynching tree yeah. at a place known as Golgotha. Yeah. And, and I saw a brown skinned 33 year old boy yeah. and his eyes and his eyes as they stretched his arms wide yes, sir. and put nails into his feet. I saw yes, some sir. things. Yeah. I, I, I saw some things. Yeah. I, I saw a woman reaching for the hem of his garment, yeah. pleading in our soul to be made whole. I, yeah. I, I saw a movement that'll never die. Yeah. I saw a man with a withered hand stretch it out and be whole again. I saw a movement yeah. that will never die. I, yeah. I saw a man who was disabled, yeah. be cared with love and compassion, yeah. carried to the, to the top of a house, and they dug a hole inside of him and brought him down, yeah. and he was yeah. told to walk again. I saw a movement yeah. that'll never die in the eyes yeah. of this black boy. I saw two men on the side of a road, be road begging for Jesus to stop by. And his disciples didn't want them to talk to him. And he said, bring them to me. I saw a movement of persistent people who've been broken who've been dejected and rejected, that'll never die. I, I saw a woman who was destitute, begging for crumbs to fall off the table, remain persistent enough even to Jesus that her faith would make her whole. I saw a half-naked woman, a prostitute in a negligee, all alone on the dirt road because the mob had left after Jesus questioned them. I saw a movement that'll never die. So how, how do I know that the movement of love movement of compassion and of justice will never die. Because on Friday night, I saw Mary crying. Yeah. On Friday night, I saw yeah. Mary pondering in her heart this baby boy named Jesus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But then I saw her on Sunday morning. Yeah. I saw her running. Yeah. I saw her running. Yeah. I saw her running on yeah. to see her baby. Yeah, yeah the movement is alive because yeah. Jesus is alive. Yeah. The movement is alive because Jesus is alive. The movement is alive because Jesus is alive. For some folks, for some folks, that might be too far. I, I, I understand. How, how really, Justin, do you know? You're talking history and things like this, but let me tell you how I know. Calvary. I came home during COVID. Global pandemic that has changed our society. In October of 2020, I, I saw a post about a pipeline being built, a plan to be built in Memphis, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. Been in Boston for three years. Had no intentions on being home. Mm -hmm. And then God called us home. Mm -hmm. God called us to be still. Yeah. God called us to be. Yeah. And I see this post, I go to this meeting, we started meeting every day with the neighborhood associations. We started meeting with our partners that protect our agriculture. We started meeting with the attorneys and the poor people's campaign. We start to build something called a movement. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I can tell you because I saw something happening. Yeah. I, I, I saw some folks who started to straighten up their backs. Yeah. I saw some folks who they thought were going to be disempowered forever claim their intrinsic power. I, yeah. I saw this happen. So if you yeah. don't go to Calvary to visit with me, yeah. come to Memphis to visit with me. I, I yeah. saw yeah. Clyde Robinson stand up to a multi-billion dollar corporation and yeah. Scotty Fitzgerald tell a corporation that yeah. I will not give up my ancestors' land. I, I'll yeah. tell you how I know because they told me some songs. My soul is anchored in nothing less than Jesus' love and righteousness. I'll tell you how I know that the movement is still alive and will never die. It's because they said, hold on to God's unchanging hands. I'm just here to tell you that he's got us covered. They told me I'm not giving in. And because they didn't give in, we stood up. Because they didn't give in, we marched. Because they didn't give in, we prayed and we worked. How I know the movement will never die is because I know what Jesus looks like in the flesh. I know what Jesus looks like when he's walking. I know what Jesus looks like when he's talking. I know what Jesus looks like when he says he's my friend. So if you got a little love and you've got a little compassion and you've got a willingness to serve, there's a movement that needs you and a movement that'll never die. 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 Glory. Hallelujah. Glory. Hallelujah. Glory. Hallelujah. Glory. Hallelujah. Glory. Hallelujah. Glory.